Hey guys, this is part two of the uh, business about the LDS Church being the restored kingdom of God on earth, having the fullness of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, where we left off in part one, we'd gone through parts of the Book of Mormon, or discussed it at least, I, it was a, kind of more of an introduction. We didn't get that much into the scripture, but we showed that Adam was the first flesh on earth, the first man also, 6,000 years ago in Missouri. So we've established that that's Mormon doctrine. We've also established that the Book of Mormon, according to Jesus, <clears throat> speaking through Joseph Smith, the you know first prophet of the LDS Church, uh, stated that the Book of Mormon was translated correctly by Joseph Smith and that it contained the fullness of the gospel. We also showed that it doesn't contain most of the things that Mormons are known for in Mormon uh, <laughs> theology. So there we, we've, we've got a huge contradiction right there within the LDS canon of Scripture. Jesus saying the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel, and uh, provably it doesn't. Uh, references on some of that that I didn't actually mention. So the part of the Book of Mormon where we talked about uh, plural marriage contradicting section 132, especially regarding specifically, because Mormon apologists try to weasel around on this saying, well, you know, God wanted to raise up seed. But we, have, we had an important contradiction there in that David and Solomon, and specifically David, um, we have the, the contradiction where in the Book of Mormon it states that his, his activities having, you know, his, his, his relationships with wives and concubines were whoredom, absolutely condemned, unequivocally condemned in the Book of Mormon as whoredom, all of them. And then David specifically is said in section 132, the revelation uh, <clears throat> claimed to be from Joseph Smith on plural marriage, stating that, no, David didn't do anything wrong with uh, all those wives except Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, and then he had Uriah murdered. So, in his cover-up scheme in that story. So, um, absolute contradiction in that point. So I said we'd be getting into uh, Mormon doctrine here, Bruce R. McConkie's um, book here, and we're going to discuss some important aspects of Mormon theology that Jesus seems to be changing his mind on in recent years. Okay, so um, LDS theology holds that we lived, we, we were born to heavenly parents. So God in Mormonism, the God the Father, you know, taking a Christian, using Christ, Christian uh, language here, God the Father uh, would is a married guy who has, a, well, Mormon theology really promotes that he has many wives. We don't know how many, but, but they like to just say heavenly mother as if there's only one uh, in current LDS um, Literature, however, that doesn't go with 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 what we what we've been taught. So anyway, uh, they got married on some faraway planet in a faraway galaxy, and lived so righteously that they became gods and goddesses. And then they had babies, and the first and and their babies are spirit babies. They don't give birth to babies with bodies like theirs. They're physical resurrected perfected, glorified bodies produce spirit offspring that get to come to earths like this, which process Mormonism teaches has been done over and over and over forever and ever. Um, yeah. These spirits come down and inhabit bodies that uh, you and I provide by getting married or not getting married and making babies. So <clears throat> their first baby, their first spirit baby was the guy that turned out to be baby Jesus. Isn't that nice? And uh, 
Subsequently, shortly thereafter, they had a baby they named Lucifer. And uh, at any rate, after having gazillions of spirit babies, the Heavenly Father figure proposes a plan in which everyone will get to <clears throat> come down to an earth, a plan which has been the plan forever and ever, apparently, according to LDS theology. Anyway, because his spirit daddy did it, right? And his, and his, and his. So, there's this procession of the gods, this genealogy of the gods, basically, is, is, the, is, is the idea. So anyway, he presents the plan and says, hey, you know, you can come down to, you can come to this earth, you can be born and you can experience all the challenges, difficulties, and joys, and etc. of life, and you'll have to make choices. And if you make the right choices, you can come back and live happily with mommy and daddy until you're ready maybe for your own planet, right? So, um, if you don't make the right choices, if and, and right means follow whatever the Jewish God has said, and if you don't choose that, well, then you're going to, you know, go to the bad place. So you're going to rot in hell, you know, like they say in Christianity. Um, Mormonism has altered that slightly at this point. However, um, so... So, 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 so then Lucifer says, hey, you know what? That plan kind of sucks, you know? It, um, I've got a plan where we will force people to obey the laws by which they will be exalted through obedience to. And so and then everybody starts discussing it. And apparently uh, the Heavenly Father guy says, all right, now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to stick to my plan and, uh, my boy, well, my boy Jesus, that's that's who we're supposedly talking about. But in Mormon theology, they've adopted the name that was created by a Catholic monk, um, an occultist by the name of Raymond Martini in the 13th century. And they said, actually, Jehovah is what Jesus was named in, the, in his pre-mortal life. So he said, I'll support you, Dad. I'll do whatever you want. And... And uh, I'll just let these Jews kill me and stuff like that. And, and my blood will be shed and, you know, <clears throat> everybody will be saved because of me. And uh, Lucifer said, well, gee, that isn't necessary. We don't like that plan because all these other folks are going to go to hell. And so he promotes his plan. Anyway, in Mormon theology, while everybody's discussing this stuff, some people are saying, we want to follow Heavenly Father's plan, and they're called the Valiant Ones, and they come down in uh, white bodies, the original race, according to Mormon theology, because Adam was a white dude, and uh, everyone else who isn't a white person is, um, you know, basically cursed in degrees in, in that theology by... Uh, how vigorously they defended the plan of the Father. So you've got people, at, at, at some point, people that were, the spirits that were that were advocating in this war in heaven, this war of words, that followed Lucifer, were cast down to the earth as demons and didn't get to have bodies. All right? And so the next you know, step down from being a white person is being like um, from another race that's less white in Mormon theology. So those people were less valiant, okay? And then you had people that they weren't arguing for the devil, but they weren't arguing for, you know, God the Father. They may have been playing basketball, and they came down as Negroes. And that's how you get your Negroid race in Mormon theology. And so we're going to read a little bit out of the book, Mormon Doctrine, and note scriptural references supporting what the position was of the LDS Church, which they now condemn as racist, but supposedly came from Jesus. 
who is perfect, all-knowing, and never changes his mind. Right? Okay. I'm going to podcast style do this for a minute here. Let's take a look at a web page or something, right? Pull up one of my web pages here. You can look at the Mormon Truth videos, gospel topics hub or something. Or here's some LDS. We might, well, actually, we'll probably use some LDS scripture shortly. But in the meantime, we'll just look at Bill Clinton and George Bush throwing the horns. Okay. So, I'm going to read from a couple of different, um, a couple different topics here. So this book goes topically. That's how it goes. So I'm going to go to races of men for starters. <clears throat> now, races of men. See caste system: Gentiles, heathens, Israel, Negroes, Nephites, and Lamanites. Pre-existence. Okay. All races of men stem from certain common ancestors. Adam and Eve are our first parents. See 1 Nephi chapter 5, verse 11. And they have brought forth children, yea, even the family of all the earth. 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 20 is referenced. Noah occupies a like position of parenthood over humankind, but all but the members of the family all but the members of his family were destroyed in the flood. And of his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, was the whole earth overspread. We get that referenced in Genesis chapter 9, verse 19. My glasses were a little foggy. Might have to, okay, see if that looks any better. Maybe I just wasn't holding the book far away enough. Racial degeneration resulting in differences in appearance and spiritual aptitude has arisen since the fall. We know the circumstances under which the posterity of Cain and later of Ham were cursed with what we call Negroid racial characteristics. See Moses chapter 5, verses 16 through 41, and chapter 7, verses 8, 12, and 22. Also see Abraham, the book of Abraham, chapter 1, verses 20 through 27. So Bruce McConkie here is referencing LDS scripture for the uh, <clears throat> doctrine that he's stating here. The Book of Mormon explains why the Lamanites received dark skins and a degenerate status. See 2 Nephi in the Book of Mormon, chapter 5, verses 21 through 23. You can also find the similar uh, discussion in Alma, chapter 3, I believe. If we had, and I've done videos on that in on the website here. This is the secret combinations page, but um, if we go to the... Um, LDS Apologists, the Gospel Topics Essays, um, my page on that where we go over the LDS Gospel Topics Essays found on the church's website discussing uh, s some of these uh, issues and note their continued dishonesty um, and the scriptures that reference it. I've, I've, gone, I've, I've, I've gone over that topic there. So, you know, you, you just get this right there on um, Mormon Truth Videos Gospel Topics Hub and all kinds of uh, videos or several videos accompany the written narrative on that subject on this page for instance. All right. Let's see if we can whatever. All right. Continuing on. If we had a full and true history of all races and nations, we would know the origins of all their distinctive characteristics. In the absence of such detailed information, however, we know 
only the general principle that all these changes from the physical and spiritual perfections of our common parents have been brought about by departure from the gospel truths. The reference here is the book Doctrines of Salvation, um, pages uh, 148 to 151. Doctrines of Salvation in 313 to 326. That was written by LDS prophet, seer, and revelator Joseph Fielding Smith. So Bruce McConkie was one of these prophets, seers, and revelators as an apostle, which they are all sustained as, but he was not the president of the church. Joseph Fielding Smith was the president of the church and the church historian. So, like I said, this is all well referenced. And when LDS apologists try to downgrade uh, the importance of what Bruce McConkie wrote in this book, we have to remember, like I said in the previous video, that this book was sold in LDS church bookstores for many years. I sold it, not the 1966 version, but uh, I think it was 1978 version, uh, <clears throat> right around there. Anyway, yeah, uh, when I ran a, a church bookstore myself. Okay, and in that, they softened some of this language uh, that's really based on the fact, and, and so are LDS patriarchal blessings. Uh, are they're all based on, on the fact that LDS theology says we had we had a qualifying round uh, in this premortal existence. We proved our faithfulness, um, or the uh, you know our relative faithfulness through our actions and how valiant we were in defending the plan of the Father. I guess right. So um, it's not a black and white thing as far as like Christianity is. Hey, there's a fine line. You go to heaven or you go to hell, and Jesus makes the difference. In Mormonism. And in this particular subject, it's more like real life is, is that you can get an A, a B, a C, a D, you know, an, a, an F in school because, you know, things are, 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 you know, by degrees different in human beings. So, the race and nation in which men are born in this world is a direct result of their pre-existent life. So it's like the qualifying round at the Indy 500 to see which position you start in when the real race uh, is taking place. All the spirit hosts of heaven deemed worthy to receive mortal bodies were foreordained to pass through this earthly probation in the particular race and nation suited to their needs, circumstances, and talents. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance when he separated the sons of Adam. So he's taken that out of scripture. Moses said with reference to pre-existence, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. See Deuteronomy 32a. Not only Israel, but all groups were thus foreknown and their total memberships designated in the pre-mortal life. Paul spoke Similarly, when he arrived, when he, when he averred that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, Acts 17.26. Okay, so there he just kind of sets that, sets that out, that that's why you're white or brown, or black, and if you were born in, you know, less, uh, uh, in, in, in circumstances that were less favorable, it's because of how you lived with God in this pre-mortal existence. And that's similar to the prosperity doctrine we find in Mormonism, uh, where it says, if you keep the commandments, you shall prosper in the land. That's in the Book of Mormon. So if you're not rich, basically that means that you're not righteous. You know, I mean, that's basically what's that stating. Caps and masks. Okay, next one, Negroes. 
C. Cain, Ham, Preexistence, Priesthood, Races of Men. So this is a related subject. In the preexistent eternity, various degrees of valiance and devotion to the truth were exhibited by different groups of our Father's spirit offspring. One third of the spirit host of heaven came out in open rebellion and were cast out without bodies, becoming the devil and his angels. See Doctrine and Covenants chapter 29 verses 36 through 41 and Revelations 12, 3 to 9. The other two thirds stood affirmatively for Christ. Affirmatively? They've, they've kind of wavered on that one as far as uh, the Negroid race is concerned. There were no neutrals. To stand neutral in the midst of war is a phil philosophical impossibility. So I think this is Bruce. Uh, he may he may differ from what I you know from some of the other quotes that we would find. The Lord said, he and he sounds a bit self contradictory. I think at times the Lord said, "He that is not with me is against me." And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Matthew twelve thirty. Of the two thirds who followed Christ, however, some were more valiant than others. So some are more equal than others in this life, right? Adam and all the prophets so distinguished themselves by diligence and obedience as to be foreordained to their high earthly missions. See the book of Abraham, chapter 3, verses 20 through 24. Joseph Smith stated that he translated a book written by the hand of Abraham on papyrus, according to Joseph Smith, which was discovered, which Joseph Smith uh, purchased with money he got, uh, you know, contributions to do so with, uh, from a man selling a collection of mummies and so forth. Egyptologists have since translated the papyrus. They had nothing to do with Abraham and were not dated anywhere close to his, you know, um, alleged era. In, in other words, uh, the common era instead of 2000 BC. So um, Joseph Smith further bolstered his position on this by. Uh, using his prophetic powers to translate many hieroglyphs uh, in, in, into uh, basically an Egyptian alphabet. Um, his translation after examination by Egyptologists was 100% wrong. He didn't get anything right. Nevertheless, Mormons hold this book as scripture. Um, they just have a Gospel Topics essay explaining that Okay, well, you know, um, I guess it wasn't really written by the hand of Abraham, uh, but we're just going to forget that Joseph Smith lied about that and that that would cause him to be, you know, undependable as a prophet. And we're just going to say that the Lord God inspired Joseph Smith to write these things uh, because these Egyptian texts of the Book of Breathings, you know, that have absolutely nothing to do with this subject inspired him to do so. And then, of course, we find there are all sorts of things that are uh, false in that book of Abraham. Um, you know, plagiarism from the Bible that is wrong, like regarding the Chaldeans, etc. You know, that places them anachronistically in the story or misinterpretations, misinterpretations of, of the meanings of certain words, such as uh, Pharaoh. Um, you know, as meaning king of ro by royal birth, according to Joseph Smith, when I believe it means great house, or uh, of Egypt, mean uh, meaning that which is forbidden, um, presumably because Egyptus uh, was a negress, and therefore carried the blood of Cain and married Ham, and that's why they had cursed children, according to. Well, according to Christian uh, theology, actually, and which just kind of basically got brought into Mormonism, there are particular sects within Christianity that are uh, more precise concerning that, but that is, uh, whether or not it's necessarily claimed as doctrine anymore, uh, that was one of the things that 
helped uh, justify uh, slavery of, of uh, Africans who were uh, Negroid because they are um, claimed by Christians to be the um, descendants of, um, of Ham. And we find in Genesis chapter 9 that Ham was cursed so that his descendants, of course, would be servants of the Jews, Jew, slaves to the Jews, Semites. In other words, the descendants of Shem in the Bible. Okay, and Joseph Smith argued that point, um, stating, you know, in, in a pro-slavery uh, speech that he gave. Though Mormon apologists will tell us that he was anti-slavery and an abolitionist, he certainly condemned abolitionists in that uh, speech and and uh, stated that he could prove it from the Bible, that it was God's will that the Negroes be enslaved to the children of Israel, essentially. Okay, let's go ahead. Continuing. Uh, okay, so some were more equal than others. The whole house of Israel was chosen in pre-existence to come to mortality as children of Jacob. Deuteronomy 32, 7 and 8 are his references. Those who were less valiant in pre-existence and thereby had certain spiritual restrictions imposed upon them during mortality are known to us as the Negroes. Such spirits are sent to earth through the lineage of Cain, the mark put upon him for his rebellion against God and his murder of Abel being a black skin. See Moses chapter 5, verses 16 through 41 in LDS scripture. Also Moses chapter 7, verses 8, 12, and 22. Now the church has an essay out on this subject as well, and it, uh, it sounds very politically correct, and it claims that you know these were just misled people, and then it avoids using LDS scripture. Uh, these scriptures clearly indicate uh, you know, what Bruce is saying. I'm quite familiar with them. And I've done videos that you will find on the website here uh, that go scripture by scripture here. And this, we're going to, we're, we're naming them, but I don't want to read them all here. At, okay. So, Ham Mary, okay, such spirits, mm, known as Negroes, such spirits are sent to earth through the lineage of Cain, the mark put upon him for rebellion against God, is black skin. Okay. Uh, Noah. Noah's son Ham married Egyptus, a descendant of Cain, thus preserving the Negro lineage through the flood. Abraham chapter 1, verses 20 through 27. So in, 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 in that chapter there, we find, um, yeah, we, we, we find that they are cursed, a, so they cannot have the priesthood. So Mormon scripture specifically curses the descendants of Cain through Ham, or the descendants of Canaan, who is the son of Ham in the Bible. They're specifically cursed that they cannot have the priesthood. The Gospel Topic essay basically ignores that too. Also, although... Yeah, although it doesn't say that they are black, it used to cross-reference to Moses chapter 7 where it says that they, a blackness came upon them after they murdered these other people. The, the Canaanite tribe, actually, it talks about there. <clears throat> Continuing, Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Under no circumstances can they hold this delegation of authority from the Almighty. Abraham chapter you know Saint chapter one verse twenty through twenty seven referenced again the gospel message of salvation is not carried affirmatively to them. See Moses chapter seven verses eight twelve and twenty two again. Although sometimes Negroes search out the truth, join the church, and become by righteous living heirs of the celestial kingdom of heaven, President Brigham Young and others have taught that in the future eternity. Worthy and qualified Negroes will receive the priesthood and every gospel blessing available to any man. Uh, <clears throat> the way to, way to perfection 
uh, pages 97 through 111. That's also a Joseph Fielding Smith book, I believe. Continuing, the present status of the Negro rests purely and simply on the foundation of pre-existence. Along with all races and people, he is receiving here what he merits as a result of the long pre-mortal probation in the presence of the Lord. The principle is the same as will apply when all men are judged according to their mortal works and are awarded varying statuses in the life hereafter. So in other words, it sounds logical. People qualify for something and it affects their future state. Okay, that, that's the way life is. And, and so Mormonism made some sense out of things that otherwise seemed unjustifiable. Why would the why would the children of Ham or you know be cursed? It wasn't their fault that their you know that their dad did something to upset Noah. See, it saw his nakedness, right? So all of his descendants are cursed uh, to be slaves of Shem. Uh, so Mormonism makes some sense out of this by saying, well, it you know it, the Bible wasn't telling the whole story. What we really have here is the natural result. Uh, of their how they of their performance in the qualifying round basically for this life in the pre-mortal existence as spirits the choices they made determined where how they're born now with what advantages and disadvantages so that's what was taught and that's what's and so when a mormon receives a patriarchal blessing and a patriarch is functioning as a prophet uh, in 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 that thing and declaring their lineage and saying, you know, the Lord is revealing to me that you came from the tribe of Ephraim or Judah or Manasseh. And basically, if you were uh, from uh, American Indian lineage or Polynesian, you were consistently told that you came from the tribe of Manasseh. Uh, because for some reason, all the Nephites uh, or Lamanites are considered to be from Manasseh, though the Book of Mormon clearly states that there were parents from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, as well as a, a mixture with the Mulekites in the story, who were the sons of King Mulek, who somehow also built a boat and came to the came to the Americas, and they were of the tribe of Judah. Um, so, if you're told you're from Ephraim. Well, that's really a good thing. That means you were really worthy, you know. Um, if you were told you're from the tribe of Dan, that might not be as good. You might be told you're being adopted in, grafted into the house of Israel. Because obviously, if you're from one of these non-Israelite lineages, you wouldn't have been. So, it's a way of saying, hey, you're better than other people, just like the Bible teaches, right? You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. You're special. The Hebrews were told to murder other cultures, all kinds of, uh, you know, different people, because they were just less worthy. They worshipped the wrong God. They didn't worship the Jews' God, so just kill them. It's kind of like uh, Islamic fundamentalists, or it's kind of like what happened throughout Europe, uh, or throughout the world, wherever Catholic, uh, you know, missionaries, uh, you know, went and barbecued American Indians, saying they didn't have souls, and if you know, and if they didn't convert, then uh, your life is not valuable. The Inquisition, you were burned at the stake. Uh, girls were burned in Salem, you know, drowned or burned uh, for practicing other, you know, esoteric religions, etc. All right, continuing on. All right, Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood under the <clears throat> under no circumstances can they hold it. Okay, we already got there. The present status of the Negro rests purely and simply on the foundation of pre-existence. Okay, we read that. In this connection, it should be noted that other nations also have had lesser restrictions placed on them as pertaining to receipt of the gospel truths in this life. 
Christ limited his ministry to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and did not preach to the Gentiles. Now here he's going to reference Matthew chapter 15 verse 24. Now in Matthew chapter, in that particular story, you've got a woman who is declared to be a Canaanitish. In I believe in, I think it's is it Mark or in Luke we got the same story. Okay, Mark sixteen fifteen, um, and and they call her um, a descendant of um, you know another Canaanitish. Uh, you know according to the genealogy, if you read uh, one of the sons of Ham. Uh, so. Uh, uh, was it Philistine? Something like that. Anyway, whatever it is, bottom line, she's got that. She's got some of that Negro cursed blood, apparently. And what does Jesus do? Well, when she asks for a blessing for her child to cast a devil out, he just ignores her. And then later he tells her, "Hey, you know what? I'm here. I'm here to minister to the, um, you know, the the the, the children of the covenant of the, the lost." I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You don't qualify, basically. I didn't, you know, these blessings are, it's, it's wrong to give the, the bread for, for the children to the dogs. So he compares her to the dogs. And in, in, in the church's website, we can look and see what that says, because dogs is highlighted. Uh, and and it, it uh, one of the definitions is uh, it's referring to people that are less worthy. And so that's still in LDS scripture right now. If you if you go to uh, the church's website here, we can uh, we can find that reference. Maybe I'll come back to it. Anyway, you read it and uh, you will see that it's it's lit up blue. The word dogs, and uh, and I I went over this earlier today, and yeah, it does mention that um, it is a reference to people that are less worthy. Why? This is exactly why okay because they they were less valiant in the premortal existence that doctrine is still something we can find embedded in LDS teachings they just try to cover it up all right he sent it to the Gentiles he sent his apostles out initially with the same restrictions and anyway blah 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 so later the gospel goes to the gentiles as we see in the book of acts right the negroes are not equal with other races where the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned particularly the priesthood and the temple blessings that flow therefrom but this in inequality is not of man's origin it is the lord's doing it is based on his eternal laws of justice and grows out of the lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. The premortal existence or premortal life or pre existence is also referred to as your first estate in Mormonism because the Book of Abraham refers to keeping your first estate and having glory added upon you forever and ever if you keep your second estate, which means this life. Okay, certainly the Negroes, as children of God, are entitled to equality before the law and to be treated with all dignity and respect of, as, and respect of any member of the human race. Many of them certainly live according to higher standards of decency and right in this life than do some of their brothers of other races, a situation that will cause judgment to be laid to the line and righteousness to a plummet. Nice. Okay. One of Brigham's favorite lines when he wanted to kill people. When he <laughs> talk about apostates, lay righteousness to the line. Okay, that's another subject. So, there we have plenty of references being stated by an apostle of the church in a book that was sold in church bookstores year after year after year. And then they act like, oh my gosh. We had no idea this was in there when the revelation, as it is called, uh, came in 1978, which wasn't supposed to happen until the millennium, according to Brigham Young, who stated that the Negroes or the descendants of Cain couldn't have the blessings of the priesthood until the descendants of Abel could, which would only happen, of course, when he got another chance to live in the millennium and fathered children and so forth. So. 
1978, we've got the situation of the LDS Church building the first South American temple in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and apparently they failed to do some demographic uh, test uh, sampling, or I, I don't know what they were thinking, but they couldn't possibly have operated the temple. So, um, because of so many people um, having a Negroid blood, we just had a disaster brewing for the LDS Church at that point, so Spencer Kimball came up, of course, so Spencer Kimball came up with the revelation that Negroes could receive the priesthood in June of 1978. So, as you know, Mormon temples, um, before they are dedicated to the Lord and restrictions are placed so that only people who pass temple recommend interviews can enter them, they have open houses to the public. It's a, it's a chance to uh, promote the Mormon church. So at any rate, um, that didn't get spoiled for the church in Sao Paulo because Spencer came up with a revelation at just the right time, and the temple was dedicated, I believe, in October um, of 1978 and was operable because the people who would not have qualified to enter in, much less be temple workers, um, because of uh, having at least one drop of the blood of Cain in their veins, well, suddenly Jesus changed his mind and said, what the hell, you can come to the temple. Okay, so... If I pause this, is it going to say well, I'm out of memory like the last one? Let's give it a shot. If not, I'll see you in the third round. I think I'll try to sum this up a little bit, and we're going to take a look at maybe the Gospel Topics essay. Um, at least briefly, I'll show you where to find it and so forth, and mention a, few, a couple of things that are in it regarding race and priesthood in the LDS Church show you the dishonesty of the church and how this is presented because um, like I said the, the, the narrative is that we have an all-knowing unchanging God who doesn't make mistakes yet in Mormonism the apologist will, will, will tell us oh well that guy was just acting as a man not as the president of the church a, a great reference on this would be in the Doctrine and Covenants we have Jesus telling Joseph Smith or revealing telling the world thou shalt give heed unto all his words and then you've got the prophet president of the church Ezra Taft Benson with his 14 points of following the prophet reiterating that and really elaborating on how important that is and that it doesn't mean someone has to say thus saith the Lord etc um, for you to hearken in other words, we've always had the narrative that LDS prophets and apostles were very authoritative. They got the message straight from God, don't question it, or you're in big, big trouble. Okay, so now we've got doctrines that are changing as the church morphs into something where it can be blendable with other religions, especially Christian religions, in a one world religious unity religion basically in other words a universal or Catholic religion right uh, and we've seen that though the LDS scriptures and church leaders condemned the Catholic Church as the church of the devil we now have seen the LDS church leaders go to Rome and most likely kiss the ring of the Pope right uh, to, to be in the presence of his holiness um, there are certain, there, you know, there's certain protocol that is followed, and why would the Mormon leaders be any different from anyone else in how they address His Holiness, as He is called, since all sovereignty really does come from Rome. So, here we've got an evolution taking place in Mormon theology. Like I said, um, all the churches, all the big churches, are preparing to be as one. That's why we have these world councils of churches. The world council of churches, or that big council they had in 2015, 
at the Vatican and Mormon uh, apostles were there, Richard G. Scott and Henry B. Eyring, who was in the first presidency, maybe still is, uh, were, were there. And making statements that were very uh, unlike Mormon uh, uh, church leaders. In other words, where the Bible teaches clearly that we need to kill homosexuals in Leviticus chapter 20, we had Apostle Richard G. Scott saying things that you don't hear Mormon leaders saying. He said we need to pressure legislators you know, to pass laws that protect uh, the lifestyle of the LGBTQ community, as well as families, which, according to Mormon theology, is basically, uh, how can you say that? Because the whole LGBTQ thing is from Satan, according to uh, all Christian theology that I'm aware of, and like a we, we, we said in in the Bible, you're commanded to kill these people. Uh, and when Christians say we're not under the law, uh, I find that to be erroneous because the thing that Jesus fulfilled, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law just to fulfill it. He fulfilled the need for blood sacrifice, for blood atonement to a bloodthirsty God, okay, as an infinite atonement, as it's explained in the Book of Mormon. He did not come to abolish what's considered right and wrong. I mean, murder still condemned. All kinds of things are still condemned. The church still teaches stuff out of the Old Testament, like tithing. Why aren't you supposed to kill people that are queer? I mean, our law doesn't support it in our land. Do we obey the laws of the land? Sure, unless it's like polygamy or something else we disagree with, right? So, there's a lot of contradiction in how this business is interpreted or carried out when you, with respect to uh, this Christian theology, which basically hijacked the Jewish scriptures and said, okay, no, we don't have to follow that shit anymore, right? Jesus took care of it. But Jesus said himself, I didn't come to destroy the law. Just to fulfill it, he was fulfilling the payment for sin, not abolishing all these things as far as what was right and what was wrong. Okay. Not that I believe he was a real, uh, you know, character either, but he's a, he's a story character. Okay, so let's take a look in the Gospel Topics essays and see what the Mormon Church does about this, because this is part of restoring the Gospel, restoring the priesthood, but it's restored with the plan, and the plan says we qualified you know, for as we jockeyed for position, essentially, like, like in a race car race, right? There were qualifying rounds. Is that all getting thrown out now? We don't talk about that stuff anymore. Why not? But the patriarchal blessing is based on that whole premise of your worthiness in the premortal ex existence determined what lineage you were born in. And as we can see, the lineage... Uh, in, in Mormon theology is um, extremely it, okay so it justifies racism absolutely you're less worthy and Mormons can do that the same way for people that are not successful financially they can say well you know it, if, if, if the Book of Mormon is true, then if you keep the commandments, you will prosper in the land. So if you didn't prosper, you must not be righteous. Uh, same ways, if you didn't get the answer that the prophet said you'd, you'd get, in other words, if you didn't, if you pray about something and you don't get the aff affirmative feeling that, yeah, that's true, because that's how Mormons are supposed to determine truth, well, then you just weren't worthy. You got the wrong answer, it's your fault. That's the way it works in cults. It's always your fault. Let's take a look at this Gospel Topics essay on race and priesthood now. Okay. I'm going to go into uh, the internet here. And, okay, this is my website. More Truth Videos Gospel Topics have on the subject. And there are videos on that in here. 
But I had the church's website up, and here we go. So they don't advertise these essays on the front page because they're talking about stuff that they hope you don't even find out about. But if you do, then this is how that they've tried to, uh, you know, do some damage control, both financially for, you know, lawsuits on, you know, on fraud against the church, as well as um, trying to explain shit away. So let's come on down to the bottom of any page here. So this was the scriptures right there, right? You know what? Hold on. Let's let's grab us a scripture here. So here's Moses chapter 7, right? Let's bump, I mean 3, let's bump to 7. Let's bump to chapter 7 here. And I'm going to show you something that Bruce was talking about. Okay, so this is, in the story here, we have the prophet Enoch, who, by the way, spoke face to face to the Lord about 3300 B.C., according to this story, which, of course, contradicts what we find in the Book of Mormon in Ether, chapter 3, where the Lord, in verses 9 and 15, says that basically the brother of Jared's the first dude to ever see him. He's seen a pre-mortal Jesus, the one that the Mormons call Jehovah, anachronistically using a name that was made up long, long after that. Anyway, he tells him he's the first guy that's ever seen him, but this is, this is like 1,100 years later. So check that reference out. Anyway, here we are. So Enoch is, is visiting with the Lord, and the Lord in LDS early scripture was, you know, could be Jesus, could be God the Father. They were one in the same in the Book of Mormon and kind of looks like they are in the Book of Moses at this point where Joseph Smith has added upon what was in Genesis. Okay. And again, the Lord said unto me, look, and I looked towards the north and I beheld the people of Canaan, which dwelt in tents. And the Lord said unto me, Prophesy. And I prophesied, saying, Behold, the people of Canaan, which are numerous, shall go forth in battle array against the people of Shem, and shall slay them, that they shall utterly be destroyed. And the people of Canaan shall divide themselves in the land, and the land shall be barren and unfruitful, and none other people shall dwell there but the people of Canaan. Think Sahara Desert people. For, pe for behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat, and the barrenness thereof shall go forth forever. And there was a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan, that they were despised among all people. No one else dwelt there. How the hell could they despise them if they never saw them? Interesting. Continuing on to verse 12. And it came to pass that Enoch continued to call upon all the people, save it were the people of Canaan, to repent. Why? They're hopeless. That's basically what that's saying, right? So they got turned black, and uh, the prophet didn't bother to teach them. We don't take the gospel to them affirmatively. The gospel is not affirmatively carried to the children of Cain, said Bruce, and there that's being borne out in this LDS scripture. And Enoch also beheld the residue of the people which were the sons of Adam, and they were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, save it were the seed of Cain. For the seed of Cain were black, and had not place among them. Okay, so that used to be cross-referenced to Abraham chapter 1, where it says the, the Canaanites were not allowed to have the priesthood. So, there we have that. Now, let's go to the Gospel Topics essay, and I've, I'm have i not going to go through the whole thing because I've done it on other videos, and you can find it in that, you know, in this Gospel Topics essay section, but I just want to, I just want to, uh, you know, introduce a little something there. So, can we get to the bottom of the page here? Oh, maybe it's because we're in the scriptures, I can't get out, huh? Well, what do we have to do? Go to the bottom of a page here. We might have to get out of the actual scripture part here to do that, just to get it a regular page on LDS.org. So here we are. 
All right. And when we go to the bottom of any page on the church's website, is this loading or what the hell is going on? We can find sitemap. Here's a sitemap. See where it says sitemap? So you click on sitemap. All right, so we got scriptures, Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, etc. Right? Keep going down here a little bit and see where it says gospel topics. Uh, about 2013, they started coming out with these ones. Anyway, in this introduction, it'll tell us that they are approved by the First Presidency of the Church and the Apostles. Okay, and so now we've got a whole bunch of them basically to create a place to hide the ones that are <laughs> problematic. So let's look at the priesthood, blacks and the priesthood, see if it's under blacks or what. Uh, Bible. Huh. Uh, priesthood. Or race and priesthood. That's what it's called. Race, not blacks. Element of pay. Okay. Priest. Polygamy. Pornography. Race and the priesthood. Click. Here you're going to be amazed at how political, all uh, the political correctness, you know, language in here. But basically it starts off telling us, oh, you know, the church is super integrated and all this stuff and everybody's equal. And it has the one scripture in the Book of Mormon that says, uh, you know, that God cares for everybody black and white and all that stuff, right? Um, and then we come down here near the end where it tells us that... Um, that it condemns all racism. But, as Bruce said, it didn't come from men, it came from God, because we have LDS scripture that tells us. Now here, watch, look how the language is so deceptive. It says, today the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or a curse or that it is a reflection of unrighteous actions in a pre-mortal life, that mixed-race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any race or ethnicity are inferior to in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism past, present, past and present in any form. So... The church is condemning its own scriptures. They're condemning Jesus Christ, who they say is the head of the church and reveals the truths that are found in the scriptures. Mormons are taught that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, that the Bible is the Word of God so far as it is translated correctly. And Joseph Smith changed it to be even more racist than it already was. So how is it that the Mormon church can condemn all racism, past and present, and not condemn its own prophets? Calling them just men with being affected by the culture in their day is a ridiculous argument since the entire the, the, the purpose that we've, state, we, we've, we've had stated to us of, of God having prophets the purpose of prophets is not to be just one of the crowd. The purpose of prophets is to alert us to the fact that something in our culture is not right. The whole idea that we're supposed to stand for truth and that we have prophets that are guiding us because they speak face to face with Jesus Christ. Well, we have instances where we're told that they have spoken face to face, but they've they've got more of the spirit than we do. You know, they have the all these entitlements and gifts and keys, and yet the current leaders are saying, "Well, they got it wrong for you know 
200 years, 180 years, whatever, right? Seriously? What's the, what is, why should anyone listen to LDS church leaders if they're that fallible? If, if administration after administration is just affected by their own generation. I mean, it's ridiculous to say that a, that a transcendent being is guiding the LDS church because we can clearly see that LDS scripture supports the fact that your skin is, uh, you know, your skin color is a reflection of your worthiness in a prior life. And that is justifying looking down upon uh, all kinds of people that aren't white. And that's exactly what Mormonism does. So one of the references was in the Book of Mormon, uh, 2 Nephi chapter 5, and it's starting at verse 21. And it states specifically, and you can look it up, that the Lamanites were cursed with a skin of blackness. And all sorts of degrading languages used describing the Lamanites throughout the Book of Mormon as being degenerate, you know, um, loathsome, etc., etc. Um, so what I noticed is that what the LDS church leaders, you know, approve as far as these uh, essays that they have, that they obviously commission, you know, it's like, if it's on LDS.org, it's basically the word of the Lord. Why don't prophets just speak on this? They have to have essay writers write this stuff for them when they've got the gifts of God. And what does it wind up saying? They avoid using LDS scripture as they weave their narrative because they're contradicting LDS scripture, which is the word of the Lord. So much for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints being the restored gospel on the earth of Jesus Christ, an unchanging, all-knowing, perfect God, because he keeps contradicting himself throughout Mormon scripture and throughout the changes in LDS uh, doctrine, teachings, practices, and policies. That's the fact of the matter. Fact-checking the truth and authority claims of the LDS Church only leads us to find its doublespeak, its whitewashed history, its 180 turnarounds, its NLP used upon the members to get them to just listen to the current prophet and forget anything else that shakes their faith. I'm Dodger Dave. Support the channel any way you can. Share, subscribe, send anything good. Financial contributions, links below. <laughs> Click on another video. Boost the algorithm. Write your congressman. And fight for the right to vote.